Uh, I'm going to be 70 years old. There hasn't been a day in my life that Great Britain hasn't been under Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, so yesterday was a, a day in history which uh, is a sad day for uh, Great Britain and a day that impacts the world. And we're bringing David Terrachuk to talk a little bit about this. David, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Well, hello, yes, I'm back in the media capital of the world, New York City, my inescapable home base for reporting on the media, and I'm glad, as always, to be joining the ever-alert Marshall Miles. But inevitably, yes, Marshall, uh, we're instantly looking abroad, and perhaps we should ourselves voice uh, what they've been saying in my old home country for centuries, uh, with occasional variants over time uh, regarding gender, of course. Uh, and that phrase now is, the queen is dead, long live the king. Uh, so yes, um, at the age of 96, uh, Queen Elizabeth II uh, lived uh, 14 years longer than the previous longest reigning monarch, Queen Victoria, and indeed reigned uh, seven more years than Victoria did. Uh, among many people in Britain of my generation, uh, it's a commonplace often heard that their first memory of television was Elizabeth's coronation in 1953 when the, the event prompted a, a massive upsurge in sales of television sets. Um, it wasn't the case for me. I'm a media guy who didn't grow up seeing any television. Uh, my family was in a socioeconomic class well below the uh, television-owning classes. But I do remember at the age of five, all the cheery red, white, and blue flags in our village streets, like millions of Brits, uh, rather like you yourself, Marshall. As you said, is she is the only monarch I've ever known uh, from a distance, uh, of course. The only way to know her if uh, you're someone like me. Um, and professionally, unlike some of my colleagues, I've never done uh, any stints of royal reporting uh, it's a thankless job, it's always seemed to me. The, the royal family has always had a curious relationship with the press. They seem to need each other, and there's been a, a crazy symbiotic relationship throughout the last century and into this one, uh, getting even queasier, I guess, in recent times. Uh, Elizabeth herself is credited with um, humanizing and even, Lord help me, democratizing the Institute in some people's view. Uh, in that um, a, la a landmark change happened, uh, oh, it was now, oh, it was in 1972, when she allowed cam the cameras, BBC's cameras, of course, uh, into the palace and other royal residences and uh, royal events to, to make a documentary simply called The Royal Family. It was unheard of. Um, uh, Richard Corston, the dean of BBC program makers, was the director, and his coverage of Candid moments with uh, royal personages was indeed historic. It was um, remarkable in its day for the chance to see the Queen outside of her scripted performances uh, once a year in her address to the nation and the so-called British Commonwealth, which was uh, always recorded and broadcast traditionally on uh, Christmas Day. Um, you know, that year when the documentary was shown, I, I was covering uh, war in Northern Ireland and wars in Africa. So I couldn't really see it as a great breakthrough for journalism, but certainly it was very different for the royal family to be seen in that way. Um, since I've moved here, um, I noticed that, well, you, no, nobody looking worldwide can miss the fact that American media have been somewhat hysterical about the British royals you know, in a way that really did surprise me. I mean, they're much more hysterical in many ways than the British press. Uh, for whom the royals can be viewed as, as just part of the national furniture, as it were. Um, but one thing about American coverage is sort of appropriate, I've noticed. Um, uh, the British royals are the staple diet, perfectly naturally, it seems, of showbiz journalism. They, they fit right in as subjects on TV programs like Access Hollywood and Entertainment Tonight. Uh, Something like that wouldn't happen in Britain, where the royals are covered by uh, serious, supposedly supposedly serious um, news programs. Um, but I just want to point out something uh, that, that 
struck me as off key um, in American coverage of the Queen's death. Uh, it, it's been acutely disappointing to me. In fact, the, the Atlantic magazine, which has frequently earned fanfares here on the media beat, not least in the last couple of years, for its exemplary COVID coverage, it's simply great science journalism. Um, but it's really made me want to withdraw an endorsement of the Atlantic because of its breathless fawning about Elizabeth II. Um, the headline on their tribute was Queen of the World. Uh, I'm afraid that's a ridiculous notion, uh, insulting um, readers' intelligence. I, I don't want to be accused of a lesser majesty or, or still less uh, you know, being uh, in some, some way disrespectful to the Queen, but uh, I, I think the, the, some of the media coverage, and, and, and even including uh, the admirable um, Atlantic, has been way overboard. Um, I should say, though, that because of the media age she lived through, she did come to have a global audience. She was probably the most recognized woman in the world. And she certainly did take seriously her role not just as the constitutional symbol of government for the UK, and I stress symbol of government, she didn't govern. Um, she reigned, she didn't rule, it was the, the favorite praise of Buckingham Palace. Uh, but she was also a symbolic figurehead for that loose grouping of countries, uh, former colonies, uh, not including the United States, of course, as a former colony, uh, called the, the Commonwealth, or initially the, the British Commonwealth, or lately the Commonwealth of Nations, uh, one African leader told me, uh, and I suppose since the Queen is now dead, and, and so is he for a long time now, I can name him as uh, Kenneth Kaunda, the longtime president of Zambia, told me he just loved dancing with Elizabeth at their international conferences, uh, something which I, I think everybody knew. Uh, it was pretty obvious how much he enjoyed it when they danced together. Uh, but he also whispered to me that, uh, let me quote him directly, I've come to have quite a crush on your queen, David. I, didn't, <laughs> I really didn't quite know what to say in response to that. Well, you know, what, what I've been talking about is whether you uh, understand the monarchy, know the monarchy, dis dislike the monarchy, whatever, uh, and as Americans and as citizens of the world, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the fact that me, uh, uh, like, if you're 69 or 70 years old, there really hasn't been a day you've been actively aware of anything that she hasn't been uh, the Queen of England. Uh, it's, you know, this is a, for people the first time you're going to hear. And I can imagine how impactful this is in, in, in Great Britain. Uh, they're going to actually hear so many people for the first time, millions of people, the King of England. Absolutely. Uh, and that sense of elevation uh, is, is extraordinarily redolent. Um, and uh, it's a complex mix of, uh, of uh, attitudes involved, I think. Uh, uh, loyalty, um, admiration. Uh, once upon a time, we would have called it obedience. But uh, in the modern day, uh, that, that's not what is owed to uh, someone in the in the Queen's position. Um, there, there was um, my my memory of KK as kind of founder, like some of us to call him, uh, is is significant here. He he called her my my Queen, is what he said. I didn't feel any sense of possession over the Queen, but he he called her the Queen, like everybody else did. Uh, sometimes your majesty if you're uh, speaking to her directly um, uh, he was KK was quite different from his uh, fellow uh, African president uh, South Africa's Nelson Mandela who reveled in calling her Elizabeth uh, much to the horror of her courtiers um, we should remember that the once white ruled South Africa was uh, originally part of the British Empire. Well, not originally, it was Dutch at one point, but the, the Brits took it over. Um, and uh, in that much replayed clip, it's, uh, everyone's playing it right now, from uh, Elizabeth's uh, pledge when she was 
oh, turning 21, I mean, a long time ago now, yeah. to a lifetime of what she called service to our people. Uh, it, was a, it was an oath. It was a pledge. Uh, she made that in South Africa. Uh, that's not uh, pointed out often when that clip's played. And she was actually talking about the people of the empire. Um, she made that very clear in the speech, and that part of it isn't played so much. Um, well, after 1961, because of the white supremacist rule in South Africa, remember the ugly rule of apartheid, South Africa was about to be expelled from the Commonwealth. Um, uh, and it then preemptively left the association itself. Now, 30-something years later, Mandela was released from the life imprisonment that was imposed on him by the racists. Um, but he wasn't yet president, of course, at this point. We're talking about 1991. Uh, but he showed up at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Uh, it's It's got the ugly... Uh, acronym Chogham's uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference that was being held uh, nearby in Africa or in neighboring Zimbabwe. Now, legend has it that Queen Elizabeth quickly ordered a new setting to be laid at a dinner table for him. Uh, more realistically, it was a, a well-orchestrated uh, PR stunt, if you like, by the Commonwealth Secretariat headed by... Uh, uh, it's uh, Secretary General Shudaf Ramphal from Guyana, a great cricket player, by the way. He even persuaded me to play on the Commonwealth side once. Uh, now, the Queen, um, the, the Queen danced with Mandela there. He wasn't yet even a, a Commonwealth head of government, though he was to be so uh, with a few short years. Um, uh, and later, when, when President Mandela took to calling her uh, Elizabeth, um, uh, when he was president, uh, he was uh, he was stressing to his people that uh, he, a black president, and the Queen of England uh, were equals. Uh, and she was very adept uh, and very used to an awful lot of very senior politicians. We know that she knew every uh, UK prime minister uh, since Churchill. Uh, called every one of them to, uh, to office uh, when, when they'd been elected by the people. And, of course, she would uh, see them on a, on a weekly basis. And she also knew every United States president since Truman, except, as it happened, um, and I'm not sure the reason for this, she, she never met Lyndon Johnson. Now, that's a meeting I would have liked to see uh, if only it could have happened. <laughs> Uh, can you imagine that, Marshall? Well, I, I can imagine the connection with Balmoral and also Lyndon Johnson's ranch and and thing and 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 dogs. And just starting off right there on the personal side. Never mind then getting into the the uh, the international and and the both both countries side. Yeah, I think that would have been a hell of a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> well, she said uh, there's, a, there's a very striking footage, of course, of her riding with President Reagan. Uh, a real horsewoman, and uh, President Reagan, perhaps not a real horseman, but uh, well known as a cowboy <laughs> in, in, in many different senses, uh, certainly in the movies. Um, and the, the, the conventional media narrative, I should point out, is that she's always um, been with her own political leaders, her prime ministers, uh, that she was the, the steady presence. And then she maintained a, 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 it's seen, I think, as a, a helpful, calming influence to her wise counsel to the politicians who, being politicians, of course, could be very variable. But it has to be said, um, and again, I mean no disrespect here, but just you know, keeping carefully to the record, the actual record of events uh, in, throughout her extraordinary 70-year reign, uh, it, that uh, it, it was at least one of those prime ministers, and I'm referring specifically to Tony Blair, even when he was still quite, I mean, he was still very new to the job, but he was the one who had to be uh, the person giving wise counsel to her when she, uncharacteristically, as we look back on it now, I suppose, but at the time, it was very much in in her nature. She totally misread the mood of the British public after Princess Diana's death, uh, with remarkable uh, tone deafness. Really, um, she remained uh, in regal 
isolation and silence in Scotland uh, when the nation was consumed in its extraordinary grief over the death of Diana. Uh, she found it hard to understand, uh, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, and Tony, uh, Tony Blair, um, had to explain it to her. Uh, and eventually she did uh, speak to her people. Uh, Tony got his way. Uh, a little stiffly, perhaps, but, but live on television, trying to capture the moment uh, and express sympathy with the nation's feeling of loss. Um, now, her younger, the younger generations of her family have given Elizabeth a lot of trouble, of course. We, we, we know that, too. <laughs> but the spotlight now falls on the most senior of them, finally getting the job he's been preparing for through 70-plus years, King Charles III. As you said, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange notion that we'll be talking about the King of England now. Uh, and it's not a very propitious name for uh, an English king, if you know your uh, English history. Uh, and a little weird to hear that numeral, that numeral with, uh, with that name, uh, Charles III. But I guess we'll get used to it. Um, though, of course, he, he can't be with us as monarch for anything like as long as his mother was. I don't know him personally, though I do know well, there are several people who do know him well. Um, and I'm going to make a journalist's prediction here, and you know how wary I am of, about those such things, um, journalist predictions. Um, I suspect we may see some uh, bursts of long pent up energy now that Charles has acceded to the throne. He's speaking to the nation later today, perhaps we'll hear some uh, signals of uh, what that uh, energetic, new energetic rule might be. Energetic for a 70-plus-year-old king, I hasten to underline. And, and, and now, basically, uh, for the foreseeable future, even after him, uh, it will be the king of England. Uh, just sure, to... the, the line of succession yeah. is clear. I mean, unless uh, a remarkable set of... Uh, Unfortunate uh, uh, events might could possibly happen that, that interrupt that line of succession. But yeah, it's uh, it's boys from now on again. <laughs> well, I want to switch away uh, from uh, one leader, uh, and I, I mentioned this earlier also. Uh, when you speak in terms of length of leadership uh, or holding a position, uh, her seventy years was amazing, uh, even more than despots and dictators uh, who who never ever reach that 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 type of, of, of length. Uh, North Korea now, uh, this week, uh, with their leader, declared itself a nuclear weapon state and stated that the, it was irreversible and that they would never give up the uh, possibility. There won't be any denuclearization. Yeah. Um, no news there, although yeah. it was presented as a news event. I mean, the statement is... Uh, is uh, uh, a fresh, uh, a renewed, if you like, uh, clarification of the fact that uh, although there are bound to be, because of the division uh, uh, along the 49th parallel, um, uh, and, and the DMZ between North and South uh, Koreas, uh, there will occasionally be conversations, and uh, the subject will arise again that... Uh, uh, in order to get any kind of uh, normalization of relations between North and South Korea, uh, there's going to be there's going to have to be change. And uh, North Korea, the demand will come from the South and their giant backers, the United States, of course, uh, will be saying once again that uh, uh, we have to rein in the nuclear ambitions of North Korea. Well, um, it couldn't be clearer. Uh, that that's not going to happen as far as the North Koreans are concerned. And uh, and we may as well uh, recognize that that's going to be the truth for the foreseeable future. But, you know, um, politics is all about the art of pressure and uh, the various pressures that can be brought to bear on North Korea uh, will come up again and again and perhaps they will you know, cumulative over time, in a cumulative sense over time, um, they will get to the point where we can, we, the West that is, uh, can, can insist that uh, North Korea think again about their commitment to being a nuclear power. 
but uh, as they say in uh, other circles than the uh, diplomatic uh, tables of uh, negotiation, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, I think it's very unlikely. Uh, the only uh, uh, the only uh, possibility that uh, uh, if you can't feed your own people, sooner or later your own people will, will, will rise up. Uh, I don't know if that's possible in North Korea, but anyway. I, finally, we'll move on uh, to Ukraine. Uh, they now claim to uh, have recaptured uh, more than 1,000 uh, uh, kilometers or about 400 uh, square miles of territory uh, and uh, actually taking back 20 towns. Uh, in their offensive, uh, uh, pretty hefty claim. And uh, some of the people that watch this that are uh, from uh, military uh, experts from the United States and Europe uh, say that uh, their tra- the troops, uh, it appears troops have advanced almost 31 miles uh, uh, in, in since, this, since this push in the south began. Yes, uh, Ukraine is on the offensive, uh, is the message, and um, much of the press is uh, is <clears throat> kind of excited about that. And uh, you know, we, we uh, as usual on the media beat, we we try and adopt a cool yeah. uh, approach to uh, things that uh, other people sometimes get excited about. Um, it's uh, yeah, there are advances. Uh, and it is remarkable, and uh, Ukraine is achieving this because of all the uh, help with uh, hardware uh, and, in some cases, uh, intelligence assistance, too, that they're getting from uh, Western powers. Uh, I, I know the United Kingdom's intelligence services are closely engaged in, 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 this, uh, in this fight and providing support <coughs> excuse me, to the Ukrainian uh, government and its forces. Um, but yes, there's there's a towns, there's a small towns in the main that are being seized. No major city has been captured yet, uh, but it is an indication, I think, of the kind of um, slightly moving, not not fast moving by any means, um, uh, offensive status of uh, uh, the Ukraine's forces now. Um, the it's it's a it's a standoff. <clears throat> yeah. It's slightly mobile, um, not entirely static, uh, but nonetheless, I, I think we're, it's developing into a kind of grinding warfare, uh, which will go on until, as, um, as the, the United States, uh, former uh, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Milley, was saying uh, only today uh, that. Uh, Eventually, uh, the negotiating table has got to be uh, the next step. Uh, again, it's a, it's a matter of uh, you know how much the pressure builds up on both sides um, to to make that move to uh, a conference table. Uh, and the aim is, of course, to preserve on on, on the west side is to maintain a free, independent. Uh, Ukraine, uh, devoid of uh, any Russian occupation. Uh, But quite how the map of Ukraine is going to be drawn when we get to that table uh, is is unknown as yet. I mean, we can't possibly see what that will be or indeed how the negotiations would go. Uh, But that that seems to be the the scenario ahead of us, Uh, a grinding war, unfortunately, that will continue probably for... Uh, a good long time uh, or a bad long time uh, that's inevitably uh, in the future for that that uh, conflict I can't see any other way and one final look uh, question for you David uh, in this age uh, over the past six seven years uh, especially over the, the previous four years uh, the rage against um, newspapers uh, news media uh, by our own government. Uh, it, it hit home this week. Uh, a Las Vegas journalist was uh, killed, allegedly, uh, by one of the members of Las Vegas government that she was covering. Uh, a frightening story. Yeah, uh, well, it's, it's commonplace in places like Mexico. Mexico are probably the most dangerous country in the world for a journalist to work, except for active war zones, of course. Uh, 
but yes, the 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 the, the inevitable phenomenon of uh, people in power uh, being so aggrieved at uh, journalists' uh, efforts to investigate them and reveal the truth about them uh, means that uh, uh, the journalists get threatened and, and indeed sometimes killed. Uh, the, the, the fact that it should happen in the United States of America, where the, uh, the famous First Amendment uh, uh, proclaims uh, the freedom of an independent press, uh, freedom from fear of being killed, you would think, is a primary uh, uh, human right protected by that uh, constitutional amendment. Uh, but yes, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an appalling sign of the degeneration of uh, uh, the American political climate when that can happen. Uh, that we're, we're, going, we're seeing, I mean, you're quite right, I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing an extraordinary upsurge in, in uh, anger, uh, on, mostly on the right, we have to say, mostly on the right, uh, against uh, the, the whole notion of a free press. Uh, the, the press's job, it, it is argued, if, if that's the right term for it, uh, the, the, it the, the, the splenetic outbursts that come from the right, uh, that uh, it's no place of the journalist to, to be investigative and to be interrogative uh, and to ask the difficult questions. Uh, and uh, if, they, if, if that, if that uh, duty ends up in journalists being killed, then uh, yes, we're going down a terrible road. But, but we've seen this coming for some time, and we shouldn't be surprised even if we are shocked. All right, as we wrap up this edition of the Media Beat, they're about to begin a 96-round gun salute in honor of the Queen. David, uh, always a pleasure to talk with you. I look forward to talking to you next week. Uh, David Terachuk with the Media Beat here on The Breakfast Club on Robin Hood Radio. You can find him at uh, robinhoodradio.com. Click on On Demand, click on The Media Beat, and you can find him on his own website, which is themediabeat.us.